Hi, I'm Milo Dennison. And I'm Kev Bamboo, and this is Rip It Up. Rip It Up is the topical show about life impacting creatives around the world today. Yeah, and on tonight's show, we're joined by folk singer songwriter Hattie Whitehead, where we'll be discussing the subject of dealing with grief. And Hattie will also be performing a couple of songs for us tonight, too. Later on, we're also joined by a grief recovery specialist as well. But before we get into the show, Milo, we're already into spooky season. Have you ordered your Halloween outfit yet? Ordered my Halloween. I'm an, I'm I'm knitting it from scratch. Yeah. Really? <laughs> no, I'm not really. Um, <laughs> it's on my to do list. To think about Halloween costumes. Yeah, it's on my. I'm I'm one of those people that like I'm a last minute Halloween costume person. So I'll literally be like, okay, Halloween's tomorrow. What can I track down in between now and tomorrow to turn into a Halloween costume? Oh, what can, what can I find in the cupboard? Exactly. You know, That'll be me. You, you, can't go as a, you can't go as a box of cheese it again. You know, no, no, no. Just... I might just go as a box. I might just put a box on and be a box this year. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. Cool. All right. Um, well, so let's talk to Hattie here since uh, that's the thing we're looking forward to. So welcome to the show. And I guess just tell us a little bit about yourself. What got you into singing? Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's really nice to be here, um, <laughs> virtually. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so yeah, I'm a singer-songwriter um, and I am from southwest London, from Richmond, born and raised. And uh, my my dad was a musician. And my Well, my dad is a musician and my mum was a poet. And um, so I grew up listening to lots of jazz music that um, my dad had on in the house and lots of folk music through my mum's taste and um, and that ended up being a really nice combination for um, you know what I got into in uh, in my sort of later years because I, I think I, I'm kind of a folk artist predominantly but I sort of draw on um, other genres as well and I'm and kind of sort of jazz inflections I suppose. <laughs> That's interesting because a lot of people, they kind of go the opposite of what their parents listen to. So I think music my parents played when I was a kid, I'm like, oh, I still traumatized by it. But you actually <laughs> you know, are influenced by it in a lot of ways. So that's really nice. Yeah. I mean, I do have memories of like my dad trying to sit me down at the piano and like teach me music theory and like the cycle of fifths and and being like dad this is so boring and now I really wish I'd listened but <laughs> um but yeah I think um they both have had really good taste in music and and so lots of the the artists that we grew up I grew up listening to kind of carried on into being like my favorite artist like Joni Mitchell is probably like my favorite artist of all time and favorite songwriter and uh, my mum was like a huge fan of hers and would play her music loads in the house. So, yeah, it was a good, good setup. <laughs> nice. No, it is. I mean, it's always, it's always interesting listening to people's journey, kind of like just how they get into their creativity as well. And like you from a very, very young age, obviously, you know, parents, incredibly creative. I mean, your dad, I've heard some of his stuff before, just an incredible, you know, incredible sax player. Um, <laughs> being privileged, being privileged to see him live as well, Milo playing like you know just a really small impromptu gigs as well, and such a you know such a great joy. And of course, his mum as well was mm. an incredible writer as well. I mean, and I'm sure some of the inspiration for a lot of your work as well, just growing up, you know, having that having those influences around is you know what a great you know not not really a head start, just what a great literally a great influence to have around you. Um, yeah and it was it was nurtured in us as well so you know it was we were always sort of we weren't like pushed into playing music or anything like that but it was just we were encouraged where we were interested you know um so like I would make up songs on the spot so my dad sat me down at the tender age of two and and played guitar while I made up songs like jumping on his bed and uh yeah it's just things like that that kind of really gave me sort of I guess a good association with music really wow, that's fantastic um, can we swap parents <laughs> <laughs> so jealous <laughs> like, no, I want, I want, I want those. Yeah. <laughs> there's enough to go around guys I'm sure they won't mind <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I mean, yeah, and, and, and as well as that, because obviously, so you would have been involved in so many things, you know, as a young, you know, as a young child as well, creatively, which would have naturally, you would have had things like, you know, being involved in things at school and choirs and stuff like that, I imagine, because as you say, from two, you was already pretty well invested. You was almost singer-songwriter <laughs> at, at, at two, you know, in, in some respects, because that was already being, like say, nurtured there. Um, yeah so what was it like when you was kind of going you know doing the kind of like developing your creativity so like kind of like transitioning from just being like a singer to then eventually obviously a singer songwriter because you know you, you were doing lots of performances and things like that yeah well yeah so I mean my debut album being at two years old was a <coughs> sort of high point of my younger years and then I became an embarrassed teenager and uh, didn't do any writing. So, I mean, I, I properly started writing music um, after I had um, started teaching myself to play guitar um, when I was about uh, 20, 21. I think I'd just finished uni um, and the transition, I mean, until then, I, I had been singing throughout my teenage years and, you know, singing in all the sort of Christmas concerts at school and stuff like that. And music was always something that I just kind of, I just knew that it would always be sort of where I would probably sort of grav like what I would gra gravitate towards. Um, but yeah, when I started writing, it was, um, it was, it was amazing really because I, had wanted to do it for a long time and it felt like suddenly something opened up when I had taught myself to play an instrument that I could accompany myself on. And um, and then the songs came like thick and fast and um, and it's just sort of empowering, you know, There's it's, it's an outlet for uh, lots of thoughts and feelings. <laughs> so, yeah, I had a lot to say at that point, I think. I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, it was great. And it also kind of provided me with like, um, a way of, yeah, a way of expressing myself that was, a, a bit, um, less direct than saying the difficult things one-on-one -on -one in a conversation to someone, you know? Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Not only a way of like processing your creativity, but also like you say, getting off certain, certain things that are, you know, like say going through that kind of time yeah. frame as well. It is, it's cathartic. It's, it feels like a, a form of therapy to me, really. Yeah, I think a lot of music, you know, that's one nice thing about some a lot of musicians, too, is that they're able to express themselves that way and you know, and, and really kind of get that emotion through the song and the, and, and the music and stuff that a lot of other people really can't. And I think that's why, as humans, we're drawn to music. Because mm -hmm. it evokes that emotion in us that maybe like we can't express, but that means, you know, somebody else has expressed that and you can kind of relate to it. That's, you know, the love songs, the songs of loss, the, you know, the happy songs of good times and that kind of stuff. So there's that emotional connection that we can all relate to, which I think is why everybody, you know, listens to music. And that is the magical thing about a song is that, you know, it can mean something wildly different to one person than it means to the next. and. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm quite often a bit reluctant to talk about exactly what my songs are about because I like that element of music that someone can listen to it and sort of make it apply to their own life, you know? Yeah, that um, makes sense. That's good. Yeah. yeah, kind of leaving a yeah leaving a little bit of ambiguity sometimes in there, and you know, obviously other times maybe not, but mm. um, you can yeah giving people a chance to interpret your lyrics that you know that might as you say when they relate to something that you've written yeah they may they may well be interpreted in a totally different way that you you know you initially wrote it as well which is always I find that quite interesting in music as well the way different people will take a piece of music and they'll be like oh yeah this means this to me um yeah. yeah and debate about it with other people like oh no this means that oh no it means that that's what they really <laughs> make in that song <laughs> Um, so how do you, uh, so in regards to like the emotions that come through music, how would you say your music has helped you with like tougher areas in your life then? Um, so, I mean, probably the most, the, the biggest one is, is going through, um, grieving to my mum. My mum died, uh, five years ago. Um, and, and actually, um, writing 
music about it I mean it didn't it didn't come immediately I always find I need to sort of sit with things and let them kind of like sort of mull them over a bit um first but but yeah after a while I started writing about her and and it was a sort of an easier way of talking about it all than a really intense conversation being had at the pub with someone about it all you know and uh and yeah, I mean, as I've said already, that it's an it's an outlet. It's like a it's an outlet for for what's going on in my head and in my heart. So uh, yeah, it just it just gave that to me really. And and I've worked on a few projects. Um, I mean, m- most of which just sort of my own releases. But one of which was my sister's um, project over lockdown, which was focusing on grief. And um, <clears throat> she got fi- like four or five, five different artists from um she had like a, a dancer and, and uh, an illustrator like um and uh what, what else uh, an actor and everyone came up with a piece about um kind of what a, a different element of grief and it really made me think about it and um and see it in a different way and and talking to other people kind of helped that along as well it kind of helps you sort of view it from a different perspective. Um, so yeah, I kind of got this new relationship with grief because I was talking about it in my piece as being a friend, um, which I'm able to see now five years on. It was a bit harder at first, but but yeah, it's kind of that and the conversation with people um, that really helps. And I think talking about music <laughs> is a good way, a good place to start. And then you can, you know, go from there and talk about the difficult things as well. Um, yeah, I think I think having kind of not just other creative people, but having those other people to like bounce it off as well. And you yeah. know, they're they're say they're telling us, you know, we know music is always about telling stories as is much of, of, of creativity. So actually being able to convey something very difficult via a, a story, whether music, say art, dance whatever is is really you know really reflective for, for everyone involved because it really gives you different dynamics there because you're looking at it like you say from one element just you know outwardly but then also you're looking at it again from you know several other angles which mm. you may well have never even you know anticipated or even you know thought about at all before and it's it's always interesting anyway just kind of having people share things because some people do obviously find grief difficult to to talk about um sometimes they might not even you know they might not even know that they're going through any any grief at all even if they're right in the middle of it it's just you know that could be like an acceptance thing or or just purely down to the fact they don't realize that what they're actually going through is a really tragic time because it might not just be related to say the, the loss of a family member via say death it could it could be many other versions of, of grief which also come into it which we, go, we we will talk about that a little bit more later on in the show when um when our grief grief recovery specialist joins us um for a short period um and they'll talk a little bit more way way above me um in terms of like the many more kind of levels in, of grief as well um but basically we're going to go to our kind of like we do a public response survey every every time we do an episode and it always focuses on the main the main topic that we're doing so we've literally put a really easy well we'll say an easy question an easy opening question to them which is to to ask them what does grief mean to you and do you consider it a taboo subject we had like some little kind of simple answers for them to go through and then we could let them expand on it and, and give them a few comments as well so we like yes grief is taboo for me I don't usually talk publicly about it. And we had around about a quarter of our responders actually say, you know, they, they ticked that box. Um, and then wow, that we had, yeah, 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 20, 20, 20, well, just over, yeah, 26 and a bit percent. Huh. Um, yeah, um, I, was, I was quite surprised in some ways. The next one I, I expected to be higher. Um, and it was no grief should be talked about with no stigma attached at all. Um, because obviously, in that, like, I, I, if we go back maybe like 20, 30 years, there probably would have been more people saying, 
the yes element, if you know what I mean, rather than yeah. the no, the no element. Mm-hmm. Um, and so today, obviously, yes, that should be higher because people do tend to talk about things a lot more and are quite open and frank. Um, and then we just had also an, an, an other um, one because they may have been like, you know, somewhere in the middle of all of that. And that was, so we had, yeah, 20, 25, 26% on the yes. We had 46, 47 on the no. And then other was also 20, 26, 27%. Um, and the comments there, so we had some really, really interesting comments, actually. Um, I'd love to read them all because there's, there's tons. Um, so literally, right, let me just find them. Right, okay. Okay, so someone put, I've answered no, but understand for many it's a yes. Having lost my wife a few years back and living on my own for a while without any family close by, I found it really hard to talk about things. There were people that offered to talk, but it's very difficult to discuss those things with people you work with. So that was somebody who's obviously compromised by their, you know, their situation. Clearly, they obviously wanted to talk about it, but they actually felt that this that the stigma maybe within their own personal environment didn't allow them to to open up as much. Um, I'll read a few more. Um, someone put, everyone will experience grief at some point in their life, and therefore it should be talked about with no stigma, um, which was, was kind of pretty much answered the initial part of the question. Um, I'll read us two more on that. Grief should be talked about more openly. It shouldn't be taboo. However, everyone processes grief differently. So respecting others' ways of dealing with grief and helping to educate children how to deal with grief from an early age is important. Recognising that grief comes in many forms and isn't just about bereavement, but all losses. Probably similarly, as as I mentioned a little bit earlier on, there's, there's several things, you know, like I say, if we're, I think I suppose it's probably one of those things we don't we don't just it doesn't initially even though at some point if we even just take say passing away element at some point we know that that someone we love is going to you know pass away or or will pass away before then um, obviously when there's other factors involved that's a little different but we never kind of or there doesn't seem to be as much although we will talk about things post. We don't seem to prepare ourselves, do we, for those moments so much. They they seem to kind of like not be discussed too much. You know, we we'll talk about things that have happened, but not oh, you know, like it's an adult conversation almost with with your kids or with with younger people, and to say you know this is you know this this is going to happen at some point, and these are maybe like kind of tools that you can use. To, to deal with those those moments um and therefore it doesn't mean that you know that yeah accept it and everyone just turns into some kind of robot that goes okay yeah you know everyone <laughs> i love's just just disappeared now um right i'll just carry on that's it but but in a, in a, you know, in a general sense they can be equipped with those tools so I'll, I'll read one more and then i'll bounce this back to you guys as well and we'll then um, have a little have a little bit of a discussion about it um so we have it has to be up to the individual whether they wish to discuss discuss their grief, but it should not have any stigma attached either way. So some similar comments kind of coming in across across the board on there. Um, yeah, so Hattie, um, essentially, yeah, I'll ask, I'll ask you the same, the same question. Um, what is, well, what so- does, yeah, what does grief mean to you? And do you consider it a taboo subject? Um, I think we're getting there slowly but surely. I think it depends probably what generation you're in, depending on sort of how much you talk about it. I think there's definitely a lot more awareness around mental health now than there probably would have been in like, say, my parents' generation or grandparents' generation. Um, so I think it's it's definitely improving. Um, and, you know, people are sort of, much more readily going to various types of therapy now. Um, I I went to bereavement counselling and I found it really helpful and I actually just carried on seeing her for about a year after. But um, I think, I I actually think um, the reason that uh, it feels like there's a stigma often tends to be, in my experience, that people that haven't necessarily gone through 
a huge loss in their life. Um, don't want to say the wrong thing and don't want to sort of in inverted commas upset the person that's that's going through grief and um and actually the reality of it is that nothing can really make it in my case nothing could make it worse really no one could say anything to make it work worse no one was gonna sort of come to me and say um oh I'm really sorry that your mum died and I was suddenly be like oh my god I forgot about that you know like it's not gonna remind me um it's something that I just lived with and still live with and um but actually the not talking about it thing is for was for me part of the problem because it, it creates loneliness amongst people that are going through that kind of experience and um and actually talking about it to people helped me a lot and and actually hearing from people that had gone through similar things was really helpful as well like I put out a music video that was about loss and um and I got like the most beautiful messages from people like all around the world like people from over in the states and people in South America saying that they had lost someone and that they had found it really therapeutic watching the video and that was that was like completing the cycle of making music to me was it helping somebody else and you know them relating to some to you know the content of it and and it actually really helped me and my grieving process as well because you 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 kind of establish established this sort of conversation with other people um so you kind of you're on your own with your particular circumstance but the broader picture is that actually we all go through it we all will go through it at some point so it's you know it's a really universal thing so it's something that should be talked about a lot more <laughs> no i really love that you use the music actually there you know in obviously a, a, pos- a, a positive way as well for you know to the benefit of other people which is is incredible um but yeah milo what will be your thoughts on Sorry, on the opening question. Yeah. Can I ask Hattie if it's not if it's okay, what happened what happened to your mother? Um she died of cancer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've known so many people that have died from cancer, it's ridiculous. Um, yeah. Uh That's yeah. Cool. So I guess my thoughts on it fall into the yeah, process it however you want. The, the issue I have sometimes is people tell you how you should process grief. Did you have that? experience Hattie like people would be like you know what you need to do is you need to do this or this is how you should deal with this and it's like yeah great thanks for the advice but how about just shut the fuck up you know <laughs> do what I want <laughs> um so I guess I guess that's that's my response to that uh it, it's weird I've had um <laughs> since we've been in this COVID lockdown uh my uncle my aunt and my grandfather have all died and I haven't been able to go to any of their funerals because we've been, Aww. you know, excluded from traveling to the U.S. Oh, the whole time. Yeah, um, so it's just so it's it's weird how things like that force you to process because then you're like, oh, you know, like like with my grandfather, you know, he it was that time in his life. I mean, so I'm not grieving over the fact that he's gone because he lived a long, good life. I'm grieving over the fact that I wasn't able to actually go and mm. and be there, you know, like that kind of stuff. But um, yeah. but it is weird how people tell you like, oh, this is what you should do. And it's like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it in my own way. Yeah. Um, if, if I want your help, I'll, I'll ask, you mm. know. There was a few things that people said to me that I found a bit difficult as well. Like, uh, she's gone to a better place now, which I oh, know geez. is meant, which is meant with love and it's meant to comfort someone. I think that's the mistake some people make is that they feel like they need to, you know, yeah. oh, well, it, at least she's gone somewhere better. But actually, you know, that didn't help me. It might help some people, but I, I was like, no. <laughs> I mean, it depends on what you believe in, but yeah, I don't believe that. <laughs> Thanks for assuming that's my beliefs. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it, yeah. it is an interesting, it's another dynamic, of course, with the whole COVID thing, like, like Milo touched on, with so many people not, not being able to start an initial process of grief, and, and in this case, obviously, via you know, a funeral because of a death, um, which... Like I say, that just adds another layer on to, to everything. I mean, our, our family were fairly lucky. Um, well, I say lucky in the sense that we could go and 
my um, uncle died on Christmas Eve. So in the January of this year, we was lucky enough to be able to go and, you know, actually go to you know celebrate his life, even mm. in limited kind of, you know, circumstances. Um, but of mm. course, for many people, especially you say people, people like Milo and, and probably millions of others that, you know, living far apart from people and just totally restricted from from anything. I mean, I can't imagine of that initial that initial kind of step that you know being able to kind of like you know that when people I, I don't really like the phrase of like you know the closure kind of thing because it shouldn't really be a closure as such, but so many people term it that way. Doing that, say on a on a screen or whatever, because I don't know, Milo, did you, was you able to watch the, watch the funeral? No, no, like, no, say, good. Like that, no, no. Right. Mm. So I think I've, I've heard a lot of things like that in the UK that, you know, people have been, you know, is it too far away or they can't travel or too ill or whatever the, you know, the place has put up a, you know, a recording so that they can essentially be virtually there. But again, I don't, I don't know how, I haven't had to do that. Fortunately, but I, I can't, I don't know how that would work. I don't you know for myself. I think that like, would just seem yeah. awkward to me, truthfully. I don't know about mm-hmm. you guys, but I think part of the aspect of like, if you're going to the service or whatever is having those interactions with your friends and families and stuff. And you, yeah. you, you, you can't do that through a screen. Yeah. So I don't know. That's just my opinion. I mean, yeah, I'm sure obviously other people disagree because they do that. So that, which mm-hmm. is fine. Yeah, it's like not not being able to be there as well sort of must add a whole new sort of dimension to it all as well, really, because that's what you need to do when you're grieving is you need to, like, huddle with your close people, yeah. don't you? Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, should we maybe listen to some music? <laughs> Patty? Uh, yeah. You want to play us a little ditty? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what's the what's the name of the song? I think I'm gonna um, play a song called Mechanism, okay. and it's uh, it's from my EP that's not out yet, but that is coming out very soon. about somebody I don't know Though the music moves right through my lips There's nothing in my soul Is this the way I'll go? I stand here alone Making plans about a future unknown Though there's blood that's running through my veins My heart's an empty shell Is this the way I'll go? Cause now I'm lost And all I am is a head that's filled with grief and worry I'm lost There's no way that I can let you in Now I'm lost And all I am is a mechanism to keep coping There's no way I'll let you in I'm lost 
lost There's no way that I can let you in Now I'm lost And all I am is a mechanism to keep coping There's no way I'll let you in Beautiful. That's Thank coming you. out on your next CD, you said? Yeah, next EP. We don't have a release date yet, but we're working on it. <laughs> All right. I am absolutely well, buying cool. that. <laughs> yeah. I'll, Thanks. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> No, I was getting goosebumps there, actually. I was literally just, I was, I was away. I was, I, was, I was gone with it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So cool. <laughs> It feels like a relevant song to play. Yeah, yeah, that <laughs> yeah, works. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, really, yeah as really we're did. talking about grief, really. and, yeah, it was, yeah. yeah, it was nice. It, it Way to really keep the mood up. So <laughs> yeah, no, sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> but we probably are gonna. You know, the mood is gonna raise a little bit now, anyway, because we are about to go on to one of our mini features here. Which for you, Hattie, you now get to turn the tables. Um, and you get to ask an American. So you get to ask Milo a totally unscripted question. And uh, I hope you've got something that's really going to test it. Um, yes. So uh, I found it really hard to think of a question. Like when you can ask someone anything, what the hell do you ask them? Exactly. <laughs> and you have access to Google. You, 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 you <laughs> yeah. want to know, you can find out. Yeah. But um, I considered asking you how to make a good cup of tea mm. um but i think you probably know how to do that because kev told me that you've lived in ireland and in england so two of the main tea countries yes and, and i am a tea drinker actually too oh so, really yes. uh -huh. okay so. um so actually i thought because i know that you're an actor as well mm -hmm. I would ask you how your accents are and see if you'd be up for doing some accents. <laughs> <laughs> My accents are atrociously bad. Yes. Yay! They really are. Um, I was taking lessons for a while on doing a British accent, um, mm -hmm. but she stopped teaching her. She'll teach on occasion but does uh, was she really that difficult to teach no was no it, no, no. it's, it's she's that... just got she's actually just been busy <laughs> with work <laughs> uh so i had nothing yeah i mean maybe she's still teaching and she's like milo <laughs> like, i can't oh, help you out yeah. at all <laughs> um, what was funny is when i was younger i was pretty good at accents i could pick them up pretty quick um but now not so much and it's harder because you don't if i lived in a place where i heard a consistent accent I could pick it up. But like mm, here in London, yeah. there's so many regional accents and there's so many people from other countries. So you don't hear a consistent one or okay. um, and same, it was the same within Ireland. There's so many different accents that you can't really pick up a good one. Uh, so mm. no, my my accents are atrociously bad. OK, well, can we get you to say like one sentence and um, uh, I'm going to go with something like easy, like my kind of accent. OK. <laughs> I think that's quite easy. Oh, you've gone really what, gone. What do you want me to say? Easy. Oh, well, Kev, you can get involved in here if you want. Like, if you want yeah, to make I this might harder. I force the issue a little bit. Yeah. yeah. But I might force the issue a little. But, yeah. You know, we'll, go, we'll, go with the, we'll go with the kind of, yeah, South, Southwest London kind of. A, a Southwest London kind of accent. Um, no, I think mine is more of a posh British accent. But not a very good one, because <laughs> I do occasionally pronounce the Oz, even though I should not be pronouncing the Oz. And um. I emphasize the A's, maybe just a little too much. I think my British <laughs> accent more or less just sounds like I'm bored and uninterested in anything anyone has to say. <laughs> How's that? How's that? It was yeah, pretty good. Yeah. It was... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did. It definitely no, it sounded posh. It definitely sounded posh. Yeah. 
So yeah, yeah we'll my British accent is a posh. I'm just kind of a snob and have <laughs> no interest in anything anyone's telling me. I'm too good for this. I don't I, bother I, I with I think an there, was, there was kind of little... I think the only, there's not much you need to work on with that to tweak it because I think that was just some vowel changes slightly. Mm. And it made you say a little bit, it made you sound, I don't know, what would be kind of like posh standard South African at times. There was tiny little oh, yeah. tweaks yeah, yeah. in there that, that, that brought that in. Yeah. But yeah, not, I'll not just start much. using it regularly tweaks. and people will be like, where are you from? And I'll be like, South Africa. Yeah. And they'll be like, yeah. oh, okay. Oh, they sure, want yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's like, that's probably right. Right. Lived with the Queen for a little bit as well, and it's yeah. just all kind of gone <laughs> melded into this. Uh-huh. So I, I reckon, Milo, I'm going to say actually, right? Let's let's think of one because you 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 guys, you know, you like Scotland. You uh, spent a little bit of time up there. Oh, I'm not gonna Scotland! Make it. Oh, I'm not, I'm I can do a Scotland make, accent. You go up I'm to Scotland and you Scotland. see yourself the Loch Ness monster, and you have yourself a whiskey. <laughs> oh, it's fantastic up in Scotland in the Highlands. I'd love to get you to do because I know you're not literally you're not a performing monkey and all that. Um, but <laughs> no, that but I'm going to get you to do. Yeah, I, don't, I, I think your English one was better. Um, I think it sounded kind I'm of Irish. Get you to do a uh, a Birmingham accent. I have no idea what a Birmingham accent is. Do a Birmingham accent for me, and I'll just Ooh. marry you. Okay, so it'd be like. All right there, Doctor. Would you like a cup of tea now? Oh, right there, love. Would you like a cup of tea now? <laughs> no, sound, not, no, that it's not sounded too bad really there, Irish. That sounds more Irish, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was really Irish. Uh-huh. Would you like a cup of tea oh, now? Would you like a cup would, of tea? No, I'll go have would some. Would you like? Go have some would tea. you like? Would you like a cup of tea? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm full to the brim with uh, tea. Yes, we'll go have a pint. What's the crack, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> I think the Brummie accent is it's all in like the intonation, isn't it? It's like doi do doi doi. Well now absolutely kind of like killing any any Birmingham person. Yeah, oh sorry guys. <laughs> so she's like, ah. No, um, yeah, sorry, sorry, Birmingham people, Scottish people. Love your accent. Scottish, Scottish, British, British, British. <laughs> basically everyone. Yeah, just yeah, everyone. That's yeah. just, just trash. Any other accents you want me to destroy? <laughs> I actually, I actually love the Brummie accent. I find it like really like pleasing, and I think it's very friendly sounding as well. I think it's a very, um, it's a very interactive accent. There's a lot of movement with their accent. You know, it's as as well as the mouth, but also just on the whole, is you can get <laughs> so involved in it. Like Milo, I'd say if you want an accent to really kind of get your kind of chops around, literally, then. It, yeah, a Brummie one would Brummie be a good one. Go. And mm. and probably a Geordie, you know, a Newcastle accent as well. Or at least a, a North East mm. kind of accent. Would probably, That's a hard that, one. That's, that's going to be a hard one. Yeah. 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 I'm not, no, not going to do mine. No. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's move <laughs> off of that subject and on to our next one, which is, of course, our badly drawn bamboo. So, Hattie, being the creative <laughs> that you are... You have a badly drawn bamboo for us. I do. I've actually done it on my iPad because I've got oh, one of those sweet. pens. Let's try. We haven't had one. Anyone? Excellent. Yeah. yeah, we haven't had a, a yeah. digital version yet. And it's I'm like always so excited to see these. Mm. Pretty, uh, literally, <laughs> it's my favourite part. It's like um, <laughs> actually, you're wearing the same hat that you're wearing now, which is pretty good. <laughs> oh, <wow. Okay>. um, <laughs> and it's like it's like a mixture of like. Oh no! Can you see it? Oh okay. uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> that's actually pretty good. The the hair coming down the sides. You need to pull your yeah. hair down out there a bit. It more. used to be at one point. Yeah, few, yeah. Like several years ago, it did used to be like really long, curly, blonde. You know, so it was yeah. it was actually inspired by current you and the you that like we the, met in the silly yeah, earth definitely. when you had like yeah. long, curly, blonde hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was I was like full vagrant surfer kind of <laughs> yeah. yeah meld mashup yeah was it um, yeah it got, was it dyed blonde no no well it was sun, it was naturally sun bleached, blonde li- li- yeah sun mm. and sea salt bleached oh, essentially okay. yeah it's mm. Yeah, man. Literally. You've also got you've also got rosy cheeks in this because yeah. you because you used to work on the um on the ferry, did you? 
Well, did you work I, on the phone? Um, well, I, I worked on the campsite mostly, but I've helped the ah, guys out from yeah. time to time as well. So, I'd yeah. just be, you know, luggage, luggage monkey, you know, just. <laughs> yeah. But no, so, so hold it up again because I want to. Um, okay. I've got to. I've got to rate this. Um, oh, right. Okay. And it's it's kind of. How I imagine thing, this, I by the way, is just the part coming out is bleached blonde. I imagine you just always wearing the hat. So like the hair oh, so it's the it's hat is going to be dark. Yeah. Exactly. And then just <laughs> the, the side bits are going to be bleached blonde. The, the, hair is, the hair is actually attached to the hat. You know, the Scottish hat. That you get. Yeah. Perfect. Well, the little tartan jobs with the, with the orange hair sticking out. Um, Wow, because to me it looks it's almost like a modern take on you know like a tapestry, like when you see like buy a tapestry and stuff, and you've got yeah. these random characters that are there. In the background, it's got a very you know like the beard. You know, I mean, my beard is it's quite boxy because yeah. it's so tight. You're yeah. I actually got the length there. quite. The length is quite quite good actually. Yeah, yeah, I know you're pretty pretty bang on. Like, I'm all, like, like. yeah, perfect. <laughs> Um, I, I literally can't rate this as a badly drawn bamboo. I can't. I can't give it a low rating. So, which is what I'm really wanting to do. But it's fantastic. I'm going to give that an eight out of ten. <gasps> Actually, eight point uh, eight point five. So shouldn't it be 10. a two? I'll take that. Well, yeah. In some ways, would it be a two or one point five? I don't know. That's, that's up. Mm -hmm. That's up for debate. Because it's I a guess. goodly drawn, not a badly drawn. So shouldn't you have a lower <laughs> score? Yeah, I'm gonna have to think about this. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> I keep getting it wrong, but yeah. it was it was great. I like it. Yeah, but it, it did remind me of like a kind of like a tapestry kind of drawing as well at the mm. same time. So yeah, and that like was my that. inspiration like too. Yeah, I was <laughs> yeah. going for that. Yeah, the buy yeah. tapestry was yeah, my yeah, inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, that was an absolutely fantastic drawing. Um, um, I always love these. Um, yeah, so we're heading back to the public response survey and also introducing to this show a grief recovery specialist, um, April. So, April, welcome to the show and tell us a little bit about what you do. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, so, yeah, as, uh, as Kev mentioned, I, I'm a coach um, and part of the coaching that I do is some neuro-linguistic practice methods cognitive behavioral hypnotherapy and grief recovery is an area that I, I specialize in um, and was was born out of really actually me attending a grief recovery course myself to help me deal with some of my own grief and loss um, which was predominantly around miscarriage um, and what I actually found as a result of that was that grief and loss was about so much more than bereavement which we typically associate grief with so, so many different losses. So, you know, children experience you know, 20 or so losses before the age of around 10 years old. That might be the loss of a pet. It might be that friends moved house or moved school. Uh, it could be that they um, have lost their favorite toy. Um, things that's, that seem very simple at, at an early age, but actually have a hugely profound impact on how we deal with grief, grief and loss later in life. Uh, so when I went on this program for my own personal development, what I realized was that there wasn't just one loss that I was dealing with. There was a whole lifetime of losses that I actually had never processed or or become complete with. And um, I decided that actually I felt that this was a gift that needed to be shared with the world, that, that everybody could benefit with learning some steps and a program to help process grief and loss. So that, that's how it came about. And um, yeah, that's that's kind of what, what I focus on now and, and, and work with a lot of different people to deal with many different types of, of grief. Cool. Um, no, that's really, really great. Um, it really links in well with our next topic. And we were touching on other areas of grief earlier on in the show um, because obviously predominantly most people, it's usually to do with, like you say, bereavement, but there are so many, many which is why we've got you in to talk on this little segment. But we had a public response survey that goes out every every episode. We've already kind of touched on one question earlier on, which is our, our, our kind of like gentle opener for people, which is, which is basically what, what does grief mean to you and do you consider it a too, taboo subject? Um, but then we kind of led them on to the next question, which was have you knowingly suffered gr with grief? And if so, how do you tend to approach, deal or process it? Um, we gave them a couple of um, 
you know, initial answers and then give them a chance to expand on that as well. So the, the options for them were, I have suffered with grief and then I'm going to comment on how I approach it, how I approach it. Um, and then I don't think I have suffered with grief. Um, and then we also had other. And unsurprisingly, and I think most would probably see that there was a good 90 odd, 93, 94% that have said that they have, I have suffered with grief. And then we had a few others that just said other, but no, no one actually um, ticked the, I don't think I have. So it's good that everyone that took part in our survey, and again, we've had tons, tons of respondents. Um, they all obviously acknowledge that they have suffered grief at some point. So that, that was interesting. I'm going to read a few of the comments from that as well. And then what I'll do is I'll bounce that back to, to all of us as, as usual. Um, so let me find some of these comments. Um, okay, so we've got somebody said, I'd lost both of my parents when I was fairly young, not as a child. Um, and I think I handled it quite well at the time, but I still can't remember my parents without feeling like crying many, many years on. Um, and we've got somebody said, I spent years distracting myself and focusing on helping others before it all finally caught up with me. And I have since been diagnosed with PTSD, depression, and anxiety. Um, we've got another person said, um, not recently, but I've lost a very close friend and a very special ex-girlfriend, both young mothers, both to both to. Uh, DVT, uh, I, I think they mean uh, deep vein thrombosis, I think, um, as well as my father to lung cancer all 25 years or so ago. I don't approach grief, rather it approaches me. I carry on privately with regard to my innermost hurt and emotions at work, at home, in supporting others. Anger turns to bafflement, pain softens into regret, and regret is eventually at least joined by gratitude. I'm an object of grief and I'd not be comfortable choosing how to approach it. Sometimes you have to suffer alone. I do try to be supportive to others, however, which that is a really interesting and in-depth comment there. I'm going to read a couple more and then I'll bring it back because there's, there's, there, there are so many and I, I would love to obviously do them the honor of reading all of them, but it's just time. Um, so we also got, somebody else said that they keep busy um, and they was fortunate they had a couple of things that got them out of the house and in contact with others. Without that, they didn't know if they would have got through it at all. Um, and then the, one of the last ones I'm going to read is this one. Um, like most of us, a lot of grief I experienced as a child, moving house, loss of friends, loss of pets, breakup of relationships, etc., weren't handled well. Not because... It was anyone's fault, but because we aren't taught how to deal with it differently. As I've got older, I deal with it differently and I'm able to recognize it in myself and others and give it the time and energy that it that it deserves. So I'm going to come back to you, Hattie, actually, with that. And I'm going to ask you um, that question. Would you like me to... Would you like me to relay the question? Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, it, Essentially, have you knowingly suffered with grief? And if so, how do you tend to approach, deal or process it? Or in this case, how, how, how have you tended to deal, approach, approach a deal or process it? Yeah, I mean, um, yes, I have um, kind of gone through grief. It's actually interesting hearing about there being like different types of grief and, and loss. And um, so I've always just associated it with, losing my mum five years ago um and uh yeah I mean that was the kind of the giant one really I suppose um but I I've dealt with it by um going to counselling and I um speak to my family about it we're all quite close and we all talk about it quite openly um and I have found that it's become an easier thing to live with um, as I have become a bit more open about talking about it. Um, and, and it's actually, it's probably made me a better person, to be honest, because it's made me better at talking about difficult things. Uh, it was something that I was always uh, very afraid to 
talk about to people before I would just put it into a song before and not talk about it at all <laughs> um, whereas now um, I think I, I'm probably slightly better at um, about addressing like difficult issues um, and about talking to other people about their difficult issues you know as well um, so yeah I think and and then I've also you know probably through my life there's been plenty of grief you know in other in other ways um and like uh yeah like losing a toy someone said earlier <laughs> yeah. Def- definitely lost my favorite toy as a child so um uh, but that probably never got the attention that it really deserved <laughs> yeah um so I'm gonna before I come to you April um I'm gonna yeah Milo um as well as you know same again um what are your thoughts on that um yeah with me I'm I'm probably you know, the, the typical guy where I don't talk about it and then internalize it and then just, uh, you know, constantly regret everything that, you know, was never said or done or spending enough time with the people that have passed away or the the loss of whatever, or any of that kind of stuff. So that's me. That's me. Have you, um, have you lost a toy down before? If we, if we lighten it slightly. I've lost toys. I've lost pets. I've lost, um, well, I should say, uh, yeah, a couple of pets. Like I had a, I had a dog that, uh, that, that died and I had her for nine years and, uh, and she was my best friend. She was like everything. And when she died, I literally just was bawling. And I was a full grown adult, by the way, this isn't as a child, this was in my, you know, like, and, and just like, literally it was just the worst thing ever. And, and it's amazing how much sorrow there was with that, you know, and then, like my grandmother, same thing when she passed away, uh, her and I were really close, but the difference was like with the dog, it was really sudden. It was like, you know, Monday, you know, we found out she had a tumor by the following Monday, you know, I had to put her down to whereas my grandmother, when she passed away, like we knew it was coming, you know, so we had time to process it and prepare ourselves for it and like spend some more time with her and that kind of stuff. So there's, so it does make a difference how sudden it is and in what those relationships are. But, um, but yeah, I, I cry alone in my bed with a bottle of alcohol. That's my solution. Oh, there. man. I'm joking. I'm joking. I actually thought he was going to say, because Milo's favorite thing, is, as we mentioned many times on this show, is the American cheese, the real cheese snack, cheese it. Yeah, um, yeah. So I thought you may have found kind of some solace with a, with a uh, packet of cheese it. There you go. And I make jokes to cover up any sorrowful things. Go ahead. So, <laughs> you know, no, but I, I think it's, it's probably important as well that you, at least, you know, you recognize that as well, which is, which is also, which is also great. So yeah. Um, April, what are your kind of thoughts on some of the survey responses and obviously the question itself to you personally? Yeah. So uh, some really interesting responses in that survey not surprising most of them to be honest and, and equally some of the, the phrases that, that you've both used in terms of how we process grief and how we how we deal with grief so we are taught from a really young age to uh well not to process grief very well in all honesty so and again it's not this isn't with bad intent you know our, our parents and teachers and other people talk to us and help us to process grief in the way that they were taught to process it. And it just becomes this ever kind of um, perpetual cycle of behavior. And there's these six six myths of grief and how we should deal with them. And, and some of these myths were, were said in those comments. So don't feel sad. Don't feel, you know, don't feel bad. Don't feel scared. We say these things to children all the time. Um, replace the loss. Uh, depending on what it is grieve alone so you know cry alone grieve alone grief just takes time the time you know time heals all wounds this is another great myth be strong be strong for others and, and keep busy and we're told this story right from the beginning so whether it is uh, you know we lose a toy we cry as a child our parent says don't worry i'll buy you another one um, our dog, our beloved dog dies and we're told, don't be sad, it's okay, we'll get a new dog. Um, we cry because something's happened, if, you know, we're upset, a parent, a relative, a sister. If you're going to cry, go and cry on your own in your room. 
You know, don't don't burden everybody else with your pain and with your grief and with your suffering. And these don't feel like a big deal at the time when we're being told this, but we, the, what the message is sending to our brain is don't don't show don't show your pain, don't burden your others with your pain, grieve alone. Um, we don't talk about things that upset us, and and so this is just constantly embedded within us. And when we when we actually do encounter a loss that is really substantial, um, you know, our first love is probably one of the ones that you know is, is that hurts the hardest. And and, and often a friend or a, or a parent might say, "Don't worry, there's plenty more fish in the sea." Um, and again, we're told like, "Forget about it. You can replace this loss. Don't be upset." Um, and so this just this cycle continues until something really really fundamental happens. And we don't know how to process it. And so we hide ourselves away, whether that is crying into our pillow on our own at night so nobody else can hear, or pretending that we're okay, or keeping busy, or distracting ourselves with hobbies, or, or in worst cases, alcohol or drugs. Um, you know, we're also uh, given an example of a child that, you know, perhaps comes home from school and they've had a fallout with their friends and they're crying and they're really upset. And their parent will say to them, Oh, don't feel bad. Don't be sad. It's okay. Um, you know, they won't necessarily say you can find new friends, but they'll, they'll tell them not to feel bad. And they will say, you know, small child, have a cookie. That'll make you feel better. Because the parent wants to stop this child crying, you know, with, with good intent. So the child takes the cookie and suddenly the parent thinks that they're happy. That, that, that sadness, that grief, that loss hasn't gone away. They've just been distracted from that feeling. So they feel different. They don't necessarily feel better. But what they're then taught is that I, I probably can't speak my truth because if I speak my truth, somebody's going to try and stop me. And this, this continues. And this, and this is why, you know, there's some great mediums there, actually, Hattie, you spoke about, okay, you talk about it more now, but you used to do it through song. That's still a really beautiful way of expressing that emotion. It, it's, it's, it's releasing that in a way that, that works for you and, probably has helped a lot of other people through through music um, by doing that. It's when those distractions aren't positive distractions like substance abuse that it becomes a real problem. Um, so yeah, part, part of the work that I do with the Grief Recovery Programme is actually a step-by-step -step programme to help people process all of the losses. So they often come to me with, with one thing that's current, but we end up working back right through a loss history graph of time from the day you were born, every loss that you've ever experienced. Um, and, and, and you mentioned Milo around the difference between time and having something happen quite suddenly versus having a bit of time to, to process and, and to, to say goodbye or to say all the things that you want to say. The, the grief, as a grief recovery specialist, I help people get complete with their losses. So where they haven't had the opportunity to do that, uh, we go through a process that, that results in something called a completion letter, which is a letter to that person about all the things that you would want to say to them, the thank yous, the I forgive yous, the I'm sorry's. Um, and, and this isn't just for people that have passed away. This is for people that may be living that you have to get complete with some grief. You know, loss of trust is, is a big one, loss of health. Um, and you'll never, ever read it to that person. They never hear it but you do read it out to another living human being, which in, you know, when, when they're working with me will be me. And there's massive power in that. There's massive power in saying those words out loud that you need to say to that person, whether they're, they're living or, or, um, or not with us anymore. So yeah, fascinating um, to hear some of the different takes on, on grief. April, what, what do you say to those parents then that have the children that are coming then with a loss of something? Cause because yeah, as a parent, you're you want to be, it's okay. You want to comfort them and make them feel better. But so, what 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 do you say to do instead of that? Like, what's the, what's the alternative? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. And also, I'm very conscious on the program to not suddenly make them feel really bad for all yeah. the things that they've said because they they go, oh my god, I say that to my daughter or son as well. Um, and so there, well, there's a, there's another program that I run that is called Helping Children with Loss. And um, I deliver that in schools predominantly and help teachers to have conversations with children about how to communicate their emotions. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of really good books, actually. There's, there's a recent book. I can't remember who wrote it, but it's some, called something along the lines of The Conversations I Wish My Parents Had Had With Me. I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's a really good 
guide for parents. And it's those kinds of reframing the question to a child. So rather than if they're they're falling over on the floor and they're crying, rather than saying, don't cry, get up, you'll be okay. Slap on the back, here's a cookie. They actually go, oh, I see you're upset. Talk to me about how you're feeling. Um, you know, or they come home from school upset because something's happened or the pet dies. Can, I can see you're sad there. Tell me, tell me, tell me what's going on for you. Um, we just don't speak to children like that, like grown-ups, but actually they respond really well to it. And the result that the parent wants that that child stops crying is usually the same because they're suddenly verbalizing actually what's going on for them. And um, it, it, it's, a simple, it's a really simple switch, but has a massive, massive impact. The, the other thing um, that's really important is, is crying itself. So there is um, scientific factual evidence that tells us that the chemicals that are in tears uh, are actually healing. So the tears that come out of our eyes when we're sad versus the tears that come out of our eyes when we're happy actually have a de de different chemical um, combination in them. So uh, when we're sad, the chemicals that come out are actually helping us to heal and feel better. So we all do it. We cry in front of somebody and we go, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. We wipe them away. A, a big rule on the grief recovery program is we don't wipe them away. You know, if there's a bit of snot coming out of our nose, we tell people to, you know, give that five. But in terms of tears... Let it, let it all out, yeah. Yeah, let them flow because they're good, they're good for you. Um, and we're, we're too often taught to, to, you know, wipe the tears. Even, again, a child, first thing we do is get a tissue and go, let's wipe those tears away. Meant, meant with good intent, but actually let them flow. It's really good for you. Yeah, it is, it is really interesting in the sense that it, it's literally the things that you're like, you know, the kind of the procedures, if you, if you, if you want to put it like that, seem so simple, you know, and, and so common sense. It's like, why are we always brushing everything literally under the carpet? Like, oh, no, yeah, moving on swiftly, moving on swiftly, you know, rather than just having one simple question, which will actually address and likely re resolve something quite, quite well. And it is. Yeah, it's just fascinating anyway that, that you kind of touched on the whole kind of like timeline as well and, and going back, you know, all the way through to maybe maybe to help someone address some grief that might be kind of like two thirds of the way of, in their life at some point. But there may be like several other factors that it's impacted that as well, just because of all these like it's like a compounded timeline of of grief, which obviously starts very, very tiny and subtle. But then it's like this kind of, yeah, it can continue like bandwagon almost, a snowball of of grief almost that we don't, like I say, we don't literally, you know, we don't really, really don't look at it in that way from the outset because we're continually kind of like rubbishing it or almost, you know, just saying, oh, yeah, that, that didn't happen kind of thing. And then we move on and then another little thing happens. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. it's certainly. And actually, the what's really fascinating is when you start to look at, the, map out the loss history graph with an individual and the different losses that they've had in their life. And there's you know, scales of loss. Some are, are obviously much bigger than, than others and have a bit bigger impact. Um, but also they're not the same for everybody. So one person's dog dying may be way more horrific and traumatic to another person versus another person's grandmother being to another person. So we, we put this kind of badge on loss that it's equal and it's not the really. It's I think you use the words, Milo. It's, it's about the relationship we had with that person or that thing or that situation, that that impacts how great that loss and therefore how great the grief is for us. Um, and and also when we map out the loss history graph, what's usually apparent nine times out of ten is there are patterns in everybody's life. We we repeating patterns. So we as human beings fall into the same patterns of behavior time and time again. Now I'll give a really simple example of that. Somebody might have a, an abusive father and they will be drawn to males in their life that have similar patterns of behavior. It might not be as extreme. It might be just that they, they have a job and their boss is quite dominating or manipulative. Um, they've got, you know, male a, a, a husband or a partner that is perhaps more controlling in the relationship. Not not necessarily to the extreme, but they they gravitate towards similar patterns in their life, and this this is apparent for everybody. So therefore, the losses tend to be repeated as well. And actually, if we can start to 
become more aware and identify that, we can go, what, why is this happening? And hopefully change the pattern to be a more productive pattern that serves us rather than one that limits us and, and creates more loss. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, okay, well, we should probably move on. Um, April, are you going to stick with us for the rest of the show? I'd love to if, if you're okay with me doing that. Absolutely. Yeah, I reckon, I reckon we'll, we'll, let, we'll let you stay. Maybe maybe listen <laughs> to uh, how you play another song from well. Penny. Yeah. Uh, she played one for us earlier. It was fantastic. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah, I'll put myself on mute just in case the dog barks, which is <laughs> no amazing. <worries>. <laughs> not, yet, hey, not yet. Not yet. We got one <gasps> okay. more question for you, though, before you pull oh. out the guitar. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of music, though, so uh, on the subject of uh, if you had to keep just one item, possessions in the world with you, what would that be and why? I was going to think about this and mm. I, uh, <laughs> I forgot. Um, if I'm being really boring, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give two options. If I'm really boring, I'm going to take my guitar because I actually do like, I could write songs. I could get, I could get off my chest how sad I was that like everything else in the world was gone. Um, and, and if I am being real, probably my mattress, because I love it and it's so comfy and I love sleeping. <laughs> I just love the idea of you hauling it around too, like throw up on the back and be like, I'm not letting this go. Yeah. Yeah. You're going nowhere. <laughs> uh, just, just strapped up. That's it. Literally. That, that's it. Yeah. Carry it around. In the world you've got now. Sorry. <laughs> but it could double up as other things as well. Like it could be like a raft. Yeah, yeah, a shield, okay. you know, this shield. Yeah, lots, yeah, lots of different yeah. things you could, you could Do you have a specific kids. guitar that it would be? Because I see you've got a few behind you there. Is there, the, oh. out of them, is there like, it, it would be this one? Oh, it would have to be the acoustic, this okay. one, because this is my my golden oldie spin with me the whole journey. So yeah. how, how long have you had that? Literally from very, really young age? Um, well, from when I started playing guitar. So that was, so like 12 years? Had it? Yeah, I know that's a good, still a good yeah. chunk of time to, yeah. to and like, I, you know, your association with that that instrument. Yeah, and pretty much all of my songs have been written on that guitar. So, so yeah, awesome. Yeah, and because I did, I obviously, you know, I really liked you initially. Well, I knew that you was going to probably say your guitar anyway, and then you then you you flipped it to flipped puns going on, flipped it to the mattress. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. But yeah, your, your opening one was it was a pretty cheesy, a pretty, pretty cheesy, cheesy answer, yeah. really. Um, and <laughs> on this show, we love talking about cheese on Rip It Up. What a so segue! <laughs> yeah, I have got to ask you, what is one of your favourite cheeses? Um, I lo I really love cheese, so it's really hard to choose. But um, Comte, gonna go with it. Com Comte. Go in the Comte. Yeah, Comte's, Comte's a good choice. You know, have you heard that one, Milo? I've heard of it. Yeah, like I didn't, uh, when you, it was your accent, it threw me off. Comte. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, yeah Comte, is, Comte is nice. Um, that's, that's got kind of like a toughish skin around, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And it's like, quite, yeah. Quite it's a really, creamy cheese, yeah. Yeah, it's good. Excellent. <laughs> Uh, what about okay, you guys? Well, huh? I want to know what your favorite cheeses are. <laughs> I don't have oh. a favorite cheese. I like all kinds of different cheeses. Um, I do, yeah. No, I do like, I like kind of like some of the kind of like the creamier Stilton's different ones. Like, mm. cause I've been, I've been Derbyshire. There's quite a few different Stilton's that you can, that you can grab as well. And, and obviously some of the Somerset stuff's great, but I'm um, always a good fan of, um, Ah, uh, what's the what's the Mexican one? Um, pretty pretty nice, kind of like uh, Man Manchego. That's the one. Oh yeah, yeah man, it's, it's that's nice. Delicious. Yeah, I'd, I'd always yeah. always go for a bit of that. And this is coming from someone who didn't really like cheese that much, or was told they didn't like cheese that much when they were younger. So, oh wow, yeah. You've come so a maybe, long way. Maybe maybe this is my kind of grief process of, of cheese. Literally, and, and bringing it through as a topic. Who knows? Um, <laughs> no, I love cheese. So what we're going to do here, guys, we're going to close it out with a song from you, Hattie. But before we go, question for both of you. April, where can uh, people go to find out more about your uh, services, your counseling services? Yeah, 
So uh, I guess you can put it in the comments below, can you, the website? Yep, absolutely. It's griefuk.org forward slash April. Um, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give my details um, around coaching and other stuff as well. But no, happy to answer any questions anyone's got. Perfect. And Hattie, same question for you. Um, yeah, I've got a website, which is hattiewhitehead.com. And um, I use Instagram mostly to post about my dog. So if you want to see my dog, you can check that. That's Hattie Whitehead Music. I am playing um, at Earth in Hackney on the 20th of November. So that's very exciting. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So you want to play us out with the with the, with the song? And yeah. what will you be playing with it for us? <clears throat> this song is called Read My Mind. And it's also from my forthcoming EP. S sorry, I didn't hear the name of that. Oh, sorry. Um, It's called Read My Mind. Read My Mind. Okay. Cool. And just before that, I'm just going to say, obviously, thanks to April from Grief Recovery Method and Hattie, obviously, and then to all our viewers that are, that are watching us and also helped us kind of with all their amazing comments that just wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't have a show if it wasn't for the, for the public comments. So, yep, Hattie, now floor's yours. <laughs>
Thank you. Wow. Lovely. Beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>